thank you, Chris. Thank you, Tracy. And welcome and thanks, ladies and gentlemen, to be with, with us in this big panel of one hour 30 that I have the great pleasure to moderate. And do well, our dis distinguished and expert speaker will share the experience using open source tools for their CCT activity, especially in incident handling, as well as success story implementing a research and development project and initiative based on open source tool. I will share the program that you have an idea about the content of the session. So as you see, we have eight presentation divided into two tracks. And there is a skilled speaker from African CCIT that will share the experience using open source tool, as well as distinguished speaker from international and regional organizations that will share the initiative in the area. I, uh, there is a, a little amendment in the program uh, previews that you should start with OMU, but you should start with Mr. Marwan, who has an urgency, and we thank him to stay to make his presentation. So, well, I will, oh, yes. Well, I will share maybe my CV on the uh, that people are aware that having the pleasure to cross or to meet in the past. Uh, let us go directly to the first speaker. And please don't hesitate to post your question in English or in French. I will translate via the QA section. Our speaker will try to answer the most of them at the end of the track. For start, I have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Marwan Barashit, who is the Cybersecurity Coordinator at ITU, with more than 14 years 14 year of rich experience in cybersecurity that started, in fact, at the Tunisian National CCF Insert when he headed the Research and Development Unit. His current activity focused in helping developing countries, especially from the Middle East and Africa, African region to enhance their cybersecurity capability and posture. Mr. Marwan will share the ITU experience in establishing and improving national services and activity within open source tool. So please, Mr. Marwan, the floor is for you for 10 minutes, nine minutes, you know. <laughs> and thank you for. Having stayed also, if I know the big agency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nabil, for, for these uh, kind introductions. And uh, also, I would like uh, to thank uh, the organizers for inviting us uh, to this important uh, event. So, um, if you allow me, just if possible, I need to, to share my screen. I think, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, good. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon and maybe good evening uh, to, to, to all the colleagues from, uh, from the different countries in the Arab and, uh, and the African regions. So, it's my great pleasure today to, to share with you the ITU experience in building and uh, enhancing the national and governmental CERT based in the, uh, the use of open source tools. So, before moving, uh, uh, with, with the list of tools and the, the list of tools that ITU are using in establishment of national CERT. Here just is a brief uh, idea and uh, about the ITU CERT program. So the ITU is working with member states to build capacity at national and also at regional level to deploy capabilities and assist in establishment and enhancing the national computer incident response team CERT or CCERT or CERT. So far ITU uh, uh, has contacted around the uh, or more, maybe because the last week we, we received uh, the finalized Mongolia CERT assessment. We, we did more than a plus 80 CERT readiness assessment. Also, we conducted uh, 17 CERT project implementation in more than 
14 countries. And in 2021 and 2022, uh, we have seven ongoing CERT projects like Bahamas, Malawi, Barbados, uh, Botswana, which are already uh, in the closing process, Gambia, Burundi, and, and Kenya. So uh, IG was working mainly in, in assisting countries in developing their capabilities and capacity at national level. In order to implement the national CERT, we have the ITU search framework, and this framework uh, is based in four phases. So the first phase, we start by the assessment, design, establishment, and enhancement phase. The first phase, which is the assessment, where the, the primary objective is to assist the country in the assessment of its readiness to implement a national cert. And uh, as a deliverable of this, uh, uh, of this uh, phase, we provide the country with an assessment report that presents the way forward to launch requirements for a national cert. For example, we assess the countries if there is a law needed to be reviewed or any uh, policy that should be established before implementing the national cert, we advise the countries uh, based in international good, good practices. The second phase, which is uh, come after the assessment, which is the design, where we preparing the detail, detailed design document for the national CSERT or the government CSERT. We are, as, we are mainly focusing in, the, in these two aspects only. Where, uh, as a delivery board, we develop a blueprint document of the national CERT project with related implementation process, tools, services, and also the capacity building and trainings needed for, for the team. As soon as we finish this phase, we move to the next one, which is the establishment phase, where we ex execute the project as agreed with the, with the member states and based on the outcome and the design uh, services deliverables. The last phase, which is an enhancement phase, where we, uh, uh, we establish new additional services or we improve the existing serv services delivery for this uh, national search. So our uh, CERT framework is aligned with the first services, CSERT services framework, uh, where we focus mainly on incident response capabilities with a national responsibility. Also, we are working right now in, uh, in the review of this uh, framework, where we also will include this, the CIM3 maturity level to be also included as a part of uh, one of the phases, and it will be uh, the assessment of the maturity, and it will be uh, fifth phase, and we are working here with the colleagues from CSERT Foundation in the development and review of this uh, phase, which maybe we expect by 2022 will be published. So here in general, the list of uh, uh, phases that uh, where we, we work on it to establish a cert. Here in the, in the next two slides, we, I will try to share with you simple tools, simple tools that we are using uh, to implement the national cert. So sometimes our most of the cases, our work and our projects are based in least developing countries or developing countries. So this country, they have some specificity. So we need to, and also sometimes they don't have the, the enough financial resources uh, uh, to purchase some commercial tools. So we try first to help them in the beginning of this CERT project to start with using the open source tools. And here, these open source tools, it can be uh, uh, as a big advantage for these countries to develop first their National, ex national expertise and to develop the capacity of their national teams. So they need to invest more in the capacity and capability development of the teams rather than investing in, in the commercial tools, which can be maybe in the next phase as soon as they become more and more mature. But in the beginning, the, uh, they need also to work in, uh, in developing of uh, the capabilities and expertise of the national team. So here is uh, some list which is not exhaustive. So just here, I, I, I use some simple tools for you. So for example, for the CERT website or uh, the web portal where the country, they need to report incident or they need to advisory to read advisory from the national CERT. So we can use here different tools such as the open source tools, uh, the open CMS, like uh, uh, the WordPress or Drupal. Also, as a newsletter management system, we can we suggest also to use the PHP list, which is a very powerful list that we are using to send advisories to the country. So, to, to, where the CERT is sent advisories uh, to his uh, constituency. Also, as a threat and vulnerability tracking or monitoring tools, uh, here we, we we suggest to use the Taranis, which is developed by the Netherlands CERT, and it is an open source tool and also it is very very powerful. Also, uh, uh, as a part of the uh, vulnerability assessment and, and pen testing services, we can use different tools uh, such as uh, Kali Linux, Metasploit, Nessus, Nmap, 
and so on and so on. So here it's, uh, you can check in the internet, there are plenty of, 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 uh, of, uh, of tools which are open source and also are very, very powerful tools that can be used by national service. Also another benchmark of uh, tools that can be used uh, as an example here, the security asset response uh, platform. Uh, like uh, here, uh, we can use the Hive project or the Hive tools, which is uh, so far is an open source. Also, we are using a, in other projects, the RTIR, also another uh, important tool that can be used for tracking the incident uh, management. As a threat intelligence and sharing platform, uh, here we're using the MISP, which is developed by, uh, by the Luxembourg CERT and they maintain it by them, which I think is one of the most powerful tools that the national CERT should use it. And we use also the different component, including in, in this platform like Cortex tool and many other tools. Also, we use the Hornet platform, which we call as a services of a honeypot. We're using here the Depot, which is developed by Dutch Telecom, also is another important tool. Then we have uh, also as a cyber threat intelligence, we, we use the, the OpenCTI, which is also a uh, uh, very good, important uh, open source for threat intelligence. Also, there is DentelQ, also another tool that we are using. Regarding the forensics, there are many, many, many tools that can be used by national cert. Like, and, and, and here, uh, I, just as I mentioned one, which is one of the latest latest tool published by the US government, which is uh, GIDRA. So for, for malware analysis, and you can find in the internet many of tools that uh, to assist you in building your search. So we advise countries, especially the developing and least developing countries in the beginning, in the first two or three years in their operations to use these open source tools, and then they can decide which commercial tools they can fit their uh, needs. So yeah, this is in general uh, uh, for the CERT project. Also, as a part of, of our uh, cyber drills uh, and also capacity building activity that ITU are conducting, which is here, uh, the national, regional, and the global cyber drills. And uh, uh, we also, we, we try to train countries to using different this, uh, these different open source tools. So we try to build the CERT using uh, uh, the open source tools also we try to, to build the capacity and to, to do the continuous learning using these open source tools. Uh, honestly, we don't use only this open source, also we use commercial. So we encourage countries based on their needs and also based in, uh, on, on the needs and also the capabilities available in their countries uh, to use these, these tools. So far, uh, you can see here just as a last uh, numbers, we conducted over 32 cyber exercise over the globe where we have 100 more plus countries participated in, in these events. Uh, I think I'm, uh, I finished with my presentation. I would be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and over to you, back to you, Nabil. Thank you. You are muted, Nabil. We cannot hear you, I think. You're still muted, Nabil. We cannot hear you, sorry. Sorry for that. <laughs> okay, we can hear you. So, we can hear you. <laughs> thank you, Marwan, for this presentation. I, I don't know if maybe Marwan should quit us since he have uh, very urgent familiar things. So if you, if there is a question or we can go through to Okay, maybe is uh, Mr. Omo is here, is there? Hi. Yes, yes, I am. So now I have the great pleasure to introduce Mr. Omo Waya, the chief strategy official of Wakaran. He was the pioneer CTO of the National Research and Education Network and continued to work on the technical development of high capacity network and flux for the search and education. OM will showcase what's happening with African and LRN and link with open initiative that uh, would be beneficial. And as you imagine, open source tools feature quite high in the agenda to be, the, to be determined. Please, OM, next eight, nine minutes are yours on the floor. 
Thank you very much, Nabil. Um, so I just want to confirm that you can see my slides. So if um, somebody can confirm, I will proceed. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So well, I'm going to be talking about an initiative that's come out of the um, African Research Network space. Uh, we've called it Trust Broker Africa. And uh, it's essentially a cooperation framework and uh, infrastructure to support the cooperation. Oops, yeah. So I just uh, talked about the first line. I'm gonna try and go, go through this as quick as possible because I'd like the questions. And uh, Nabila said, the less time I spend, the more questions I get. <laughs> so <laughs> so, what, so it, is, it is a cooperation framework, uh, you know, focused on African entrance to sets, but uh, such infrastructure does not really exist in Africa. So we're hoping that, you know, uh, it will be used by all kinds of security teams. So for those who are familiar with, um, trusted introducer from in Europe. I think some African teams are actually listed on that platform. It is, a, it is very similar. We, um, we are working, as you will find out with the Open Set Foundation, which is, which is what's responsible for that platform uh, to sort of ensure some complementarity between what we do and our European partners. So it's on the slide, it, it does, uh, for those that do not know, it lists uh, security teams, the platform lists security teams, accredited, accredit them with, uh, based on principles of the community that support it and then provides member services. So alongside, alongside the infrastructure, we also have uh, a plan for training and infrastructure development. So at this point in time, uh, those are the partners in uh, Trust Broker Africa, the three regional RENs, uh, Open Set Foundation, uh, the Africa Connect3 project, and uh, the European Commission uh, through its funding. So I, was, I talked about the Africa Connect3 project, which is really driving uh, the funding of this initiative. So I thought I'll just um, share a bit with you know, the folks who are not familiar with what the research networks are doing in Africa and this particular project. So this is a project co-funded by uh, the European Union and African NREM partners. So we have been, uh, this particular iteration started in 2019, but the project is 10 years old. So in the 10 years, we've managed to connect 22 out of the 38 NRENs in Africa. So basically creating uh, interconnection of these national networks across the continent. And in this particular iteration, Africa Connect 3, we are focused on uh, certain initiatives, Trust Broke Africa is one of them, and human capacity building. So although this is new, um, this, is, uh, this, is a, this is an idea that, has, that is at least six to seven years old. There have been several unsuccessful attempts to get this going, some in partnership with Africa Set and others. Uh, but we finally got some funding in 2019. So what we really plan to do is make sure that, you know, end rents are, can be catered for with security teams and these security teams have a path to maturity. We also want to provide a platform for cooperative processing of threat intelligence and data. We see these networks in um, as um, the African Research Education Networks and the universities as uh, a vital part of that whole ecosystem that we should all work with. And then we do have a uh, capacity building plan under something we call the Africa Training Initiative, uh, which is essentially inverting uh, the cost profile of training. So instead of taking people to uh, training, we bring the trainers to the people. So under that, we're having like it's on screen transits to get people started. We have three regions, like I mentioned, uh, for the regional research networks. I work for Wakren. Wakren is a Western Central African uh, region, but there's also the Ubuntu Alliance in the South and East and ASREN, which covers you know, North Africa and the Arab regions. So we, we will start with you know, training to get the NREN sister started. 
and uh, training to support them as they as they go. So that's the first we've we've kicked this off in in uh, October uh, in Togo in Lome, Togo. Now this is um, it was hosted by the NREN and the National Set Set.tg. Now this is a model that we would like to promote. Uh, so in every every time we we sort of establish an NREN set, we have some way to connect it to the local ecosystem uh, within the country and, and beyond. So they, they say pictures um, uh, speak a thousand words. So we have classrooms and we had a good, actually had a visit from Okwasi. Okwasi is a, a regional project, um, collaboration between ECOWAS and uh, the EU. So they came and joined us in Togo. Um, those are the sort of relationships we're looking to build. One of the reasons why I'm here talking to you is also to, to sort of encourage more uh, more contact. So this is my last slide. So um, I've left it pretty empty so you could ask me questions, but um, it's really, I'm here to call uh, for collaboration. I've been listening to quite a few of the presentations. I can see that, you know, uh, there's the, we can feel a gap here. <clears throat> we can feel a gap here. There's much more that we can do within academia and the research and the, within the research networks. And I, and I, it would be really interesting for those who find this interesting to connect to us. But what we would like to do is uh, define some concrete ways in which can, we can work together. We definitely want to link in the model I described, first on a national level, uh, then on a regional level and continental as the case may be. We're working very closely with Africa CERT, uh, but we also want to work with others. Like, you know, I mentioned that this infrastructure does not really exist in Africa at the moment, so we would want to share it. Uh, and we are open to how that's developed. We, we see this as being governed by the community. So we want to sort of grow that community. And then in, in terms of the service infrastructure that we, we talked about, we want to extend that as well. We haven't actually started developing the threat intelligence platform. We can, I can see that obviously more competence in the in the um, community, there's uh, the cybersecurity community and we might have uh, within ours and we'd like to leverage that as well. So I have left an email address there for anyone who's interested to email us and um, I'd um, be grateful for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Omar, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And I think the call is made if people would be interested to join. And uh, maybe we shall go to the next presentation, which will be made by Mr. Kevin Maynard, a member of the Internet Society, leading the MNLS project, which is Mutually Assured Norm and Routing Security, an industry developed, in fact, initiative aiming to improve the security and the resilience of the global internet routing system. Mr. Kevin will show his NLS activity in securing the internet of questions. I will, uh, as uh, I did, uh, send the CV uh, by uh, message. Please. Oh, okay, thank you, Professor Nabil. Uh, can you hear me okay? And can you see the slides on the screen? Yes, Kevin, we can see your slides. In okay, end. thank you very much. Okay, so yes, I wanted to, well, thank you very much for allowing me to come and talk about the MANAD initiative, uh, but also the MANAD observatory tool that we've been uh, developing over the past uh, couple of years. So I just wanted to set the scene um, as to why we're doing this. Um, so there are nearly uh, 73,000 networks connected to the internet, um, which each use an autonomous system number to identify themselves. Um, and there are also just over 902,000 uh, advertised routes on the internet. So this is the scale of the global internet. Now, BGP is a well-established and reliable protocol that is used to exchange reachability information, um, but it's based entirely on unverified trust between networks. Um, so in other words, there's no built-in validation that routing updates are legitimate, uh, 
and basically anyone can announce anything and any network can masquerade as another network. So that's the basic problem um, that we're up against. So the result is uh, that the routing system is under attack every day uh, and there's sort of three types of uh, incident that we see. You have uh, route hijacks. Um, this is where a network is essentially claiming to be another network and can route to that network. Uh, you have route leaks, which is uh, essentially a misorigination, so that the packets will go through the wrong network to the destination. Usually, we'll get there, but uh, it's often accidental misconfiguration. Um, and then finally, you have IP address spoofing, which is actually perhaps more familiar to people. Um, so this is one of the causes of uh, distributed denial of service attacks, for example. Now. These issues have been known for a long time, um, and there are established solutions. Um, I should say established, well known established industry solutions. Um, but one of the disincentives to introducing these are that each network operator needs to contribute to the routing security. Um, and by themselves, implementing these measures by yourself um, doesn't actually bring immediate benefits to your network. But the particular problem is that routing incidents can be um, also quite hard to identify, um, debug and fix as well. So Mandos is therefore trying to bring together these practices um, by providing these well-defined actions. You can see those on the, on the slide. And the aim is really to eliminate um, you know, most of the common threats to the global routing system. Um, so it's really based on the idea that if enough network operators um, implement these measures um, and collaborate to, to improve routing security, uh, this will improve uh, the, the security and resilience of, of the internet infrastructure. So just looking at the four main actions uh, that we have, um, for example, you have filtering. Um, so this is really setting up your routers so that um, it's preventing propagation of uh, incorrect informa routing information. Um, ensuring that your route announcements are correct. Um, you have anti-spoofing, so this is preventing traffic uh, with spoof source IP addresses from um, emanating from your networks. You have coordination, so this is a two-pronged thing, so this is ensuring that your contact information is valid and up-to-date, but also that uh, you're responsive if you're, if you do experience a network incident, uh, you can respond to other networks quickly and address those problems. And then finally, you have uh, global validation. So this is again two pronged, uh, a two pronged thing. So you can either put your publish your uh, routing information in an internet routing registry. Um, in Africa, typically that would be the AFRINIC routing registry. Um, or alternatively, or in addition to, you can uh, create or you can utilize RPKI. So you can create. Uh, rowers for your uh, internet resources. But as I mentioned, one of the problems is that network operators are not always aware uh, that they're originating or propagating routing incidents. Uh, so this is where we internet societies come in and invented the, well not invented, it's developed um, the Manus Observatory. Um, so this, the aim is to help um, networks identify and monitor where they have these problems. Now, if I had more time, I would actually do a live demo of this. So this is just a screenshot. Or these are just screenshots. Uh, there's a lot that this observatory can do, but I really just wanted to raise awareness of, um, uh, of, of some of the things that, 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 this, uh, that, that this tool can help with. So I'm, at the moment, I'm looking at uh, the whole of the continent of Africa and all of the networks that are registered in Africa. Um, and this is really showing how they, uh, how these networks meet the, the, the four, which is really effectively five manners actions. So, um, you know, generally you don't see too many routing incidents in Africa for various reasons. Africa is actually in many respects quite good for routing security. Um, we don't have too much information on anti-spoofing because that's one of these uh, things that we can't measure passively. We need to actively measure that one. Looks like all of the contact information is up to date. And then when it comes to entering uh, routes uh, in, a, in the IRR, um, I, you know, it, obviously there's room for improvement there, um, but Africa does globally quite well in terms of registering its uh, uh, um, routes in a IRR. 
Um, one area where it's perhaps a bit behind globally is in uh, RPKI, so the creation of ROAS for, for those resources, but that, that's not hugely off the, the, the global average there. So we get this information from a number of publicly available data sources, um, for example, BGP Stream, the CIDR report, which is provided by APNIC Labs, um, Peering DB is one of the data sources, uh, CADA anti spoofer, and um, Bright Stat as well. So, this is collating a number of different data sources. Uh, we can add to these data sources as time progresses, and that's what we hope to do to improve um, the quality of the data. But as well as um, the dashboard overview, um, we can also drill down into the data for each uh, individual network. Um, so, you can do this by the whole of the internet, you can do this by Africa, you can do this by sub-region uh, within different continents, by RIR region, and in fact you could do this by individual country as well. Um, it's also possible to create custom groups, so a CSERC could create a constituency group uh, and define all of the ASs that belong to its constituency, and you can use that to monitor your uh, the conformance with uh, these routing security measures. So it, it, it's a pretty powerful thing. I've just got a screenshot of um, uh, the African networks. Um, this is just, this is in, I think in order, rough order of, of uh, AS. Um, fortunately, all of these are pretty, looking pretty good. There's some that aren't as good, but I just showed you the good ones. Uh, I don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, but it, 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 it um, what you can also do is, although this gives you the sort of overview scores, you can also drill down um, into the data um, and, and get finer uh, information. So you can actually look at where the exact browsing incident is. You can look at where spoof data has come from. Um, you can look at the path through the internet where you've, you've received a route leak. Um, so there's quite a lot you can do and get that actual information. So the aggregated data can actually be viewed by anybody, um, but the individual uh, network data does require a, a, a login. Um, but we are actually happy to offer CSERTs an account, well, accredited CSERTs, um, an account that can provide access to the data for all of their uh, constituencies if they're interested. We'd be very happy to do that. Um, and whilst it isn't directly related to the tool itself, um, we're really keen to see CSERTs getting involved in routing security issues. Um, it's not something that's traditionally part of a CSERT portfolio. Um, but there's a number of ways in which you can get involved in routing security. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these in the interest of time. Um, I think these slides will be available. Uh, but certainly the Manners Observatory uh, is a really useful tool for looking at uh, and monitoring um, the routing situation uh, within your constituencies. So again, I would reiterate that um, we're happy to offer accounts. Uh, if you interested in more information, please go to um, www.manners.org. Um, and if you're interested in looking at the observatory, um, again, that, that most of this information is publicly available. Um, you can look at that at uh, observatory.manners.org. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to take any questions if there are any. Like we have some shy audience members today. <laughs> well, I'm happy to if, if if people have questions afterwards. Um, my contact details are on the slides. Uh, mail at isoc.org. Uh, I'm happy to um, discuss further. Sorry, I have a problem with my micro. <laughs> I said that we have to make, uh, but at the end of the session. And uh, we haven't not received any question uh, till now. So uh, may I introduce the uh, next speaker, Mrs. Mrs. Yun, sorry, Mrs. Yunju Park. She's a general researcher at QSRTC. She's in charge of the international, well, she's in charge of uh, international domestic cooperation among CCS. So please, uh, Mr. Yunju. Uh, 
eight minutes as you requested or more if you want. Okay. Um, thank yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Nabisakwi, for the introduction. Uh, hello, this is Nju Beck from KRSAT-CC uh, of Korea Internet and Security Agency. Uh, it's a great pleasure to take uh, part of this first African and Arab Regional Symposium. Today, I'd like to uh, talk about cyber exercises as a sister success story. Uh, my, my presentation has two parts, the introduction of the cyber exercise conducted by KRSOTCC and APCERT. Uh, my talk is not that technical and it is very simple and easy. Uh, KRSOTCC is the national CSERT for the private sector in South Korea. Uh, our main activities can be largely divided into prevention, response, uh, recovery analysis, and cooperation. As part of our cyber threat uh, prevention activities, we conduct cyber exercise. Often small and medium-sized business do not uh, have the budget or hu human resources to conduct cyber exercise on their own. Uh, as of 2019, there were 6.8 million small, medium-sized uh, enterprises registered in South Korea. Uh, that is why CARES or TCC conduct cyber exercises focusing on these businesses. Uh, the exercise includes responding to phishing emails, DDoS attack response. And for some participating companies, uh, we conduct a penetration test. Uh, this is a screenshot uh, from an, an actual phishing email response exercise. Also, this slide shows you the effects of phishing email response exercise it can be seen that the click rate for phishing emails is higher for new participating companies than for uh, companies that had participated in the past exercises. Now, the exercise is held once in the first half and once in the second half of the year. Comparing the first and second half uh, exercise, uh, the click rate in the second half is lower than the first half. For uh, data attack response exercise, uh, we expect participating companies uh, experience a DDoS attack on their running websites uh, than being prepared for this kind of uh, attack might be in the future. For penetration test, uh, we aim that uh, participating companies take security uh, measures on finding uh, vulnerabilities. All right, second, uh, the cyber exercise of AP CERT. Uh, AP CERT is like the uh, Africa CERT of Asia Pacific region. I'm on the AP CERT steering committee and the uh, membership working group convener, as well as the member of uh, cyber drill working group. Uh, this year, I am also leading uh, the drill working group. AP CERT cyber exercise is held once a year and is done through the cooperation of the drill working group. Um, AP CERT is not just for one country or one organization. Uh, for this reason, the voluntary cooperation of members becomes the foundation to support the cyber exercise. Uh, there are a total of 12 teams in the drill working group. Uh, each team prepares the infrastructures, uh, develops artifacts and scenarios and et cetera, and et cetera. It takes at least five months uh, to prepare, conduct, and report the result for the exercise. But each team has their own job, and the five months for uh, the cyber drill cannot be done by a single team or a single person. 
that there is why the division of work among working group members is very important. Let me take the example of the cyber exercise in 2021. Uh, the theme uh, was responding to supply chain attack uh, targeting work from home environment. A total of 27 organizations from 21 countries, including two Africa third members participated. Thank you very much. Um, the scenario and artifact development was led by uh, KR.CC and development to uh, development took about three months, uh, reviewing and finalizing the injects with um, all members also took about one month. Uh, this is a kind of a tabletop exercise with a scripted scenario. Uh, Tyser worked on uh, the RT system to send out the injects and HK third on the IRC of uh, application and domain and IP addresses. Uh, the guidance was made by OSERT, uh, Queensland University CERT of Australia, and the survey exercise training was conducted by TWN CERT. All other members also participated in the scenar uh, scenarios and provided valuable reviews and feedback. Conducting a cyber exercise is not small task and it is not a task just for the working group. Uh, most of the participants evaluated the cyber exercise positively and many expressed uh, their intent to parti participate again. Uh, only when the participating teams play their roles as players, the exercise can be successful. And we can achieve the original purpose of a strengthening um, cyber threat response capabilities of our member organizations. It is the responsibility of AP uh, operational members to uh, participate in the cyber drill. Uh, whether you are a player, a member of a working group, uh, or an exercise controller or an, an observer, uh, everyone's cooperation is required in order to conduct the drill successfully. The so creating and sending out inject is of no use if no one uh, solves them. And even if you have a scenario, you don't, you can't uh, do anything without the infrastructures to send out the inject. It is the cooperation and participation of all APC member countries that make uh, cyberspace safe. So making sure of my safety is the way to not cause harm to others. Uh, the other way around is also true. The AP CERT and CARES of CC uh, will continue to strive to strengthen the capabilities of, of our member uh, organizations and my country through a cyber exercise. Okay, this is uh, the end of my presentation and thank you, 감사합니다. I'm handing over to the mic, uh, handing over microphone to the Professor Nabil. Thank you very much, Yunju, for this uh, presentation. And I think uh, to return to the open source tool, sure, you will use a lot of open source tool to conduct such uh, exercises. So now we have uh, we have five minutes for question. Uh, please, guys, if you have any question through the QR section, you can post your question, or we can. Maybe I have a question for Omu. Since uh, yes, Professor Nabil. Professor Nabil, are you still there? See, it looks like oh, Professor Nabil. Yeah, I lose my connection. I am okay. back. <laughs> You're back. I don't know what happened. Uh, I don't know if uh, Omu heard my question or should I repeat? Uh, or please, please repeat. repeat. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, oh, I just wanted, uh, since you have a very strategic position uh, and relationship with universities and so on, which strategy, uh, is there any strategy, is there any action to push that uh, during education, you know, for the teaching for engineers and so on, we'll more focus on teaching on open source tools as it should be because we cannot teach with commercial tools at the university for, for not making marketing for anyone. And if there is a push for some research development activity to you know, customize some tools, integrate some tools to better protect the infrastructure of those uh, networks. Precisely. Um... I sort of touched slightly on it in my last slide. They're talking about open initiatives. So basically the work we do within uh, the research networks is based on uh, open technology, unless where it is not possible uh, for some, for whatever operational reason. So the, the, the go-to is open source or open platforms. And that's not just um, within uh, so the networks, you know, even with the scholarly platforms that we are starting to uh, deploy. Uh, in some countries, we are looking at shared platforms. They're all open source. So the, the, the issue of security has become really uh, forefront, which is why T Trust Broker Africa was, uh, was always in the, uh, in the front burner. So yes, the answer to that is yes. Uh, but saying that, you know, there's still a, a need to collaborate to sort of realize the the aspiration so I, I cannot you know i cannot overemphasize that especially within this area so we're looking for uh, we're hoping that the models that we you know that we're looking at you know so because the national sets and the n rents are both national structures that there is a natural synergy there but uh, yes i'll be happy to associate with existing uh, collaboration on any open initiative that sort of drives the agenda. Thank you. Is there any question also from the speaker? If you want, uh, we should move to the second track of the session, which will more focus on open source tools. Uh, so maybe uh, we should. Do if it's allowed to me, I have a few couple of, uh, of uh, slides to just focus on the interest of open source for CCS activity, since we have no question. I can do that rapidly. Is it okay? <laughs> So just to talk about uh, for CCIT, what happened for CCIT, why open source is very interesting, especially for African CCIT, is when we go to build the CCIT, the cost come from equipment, some PC server and some other fancy tools, but the most massive costs come from software tools. So that's the, uh, the problem is uh, that uh, license fee are big and are recurrent. Any year we have to pay again for annual maintenance fee. So how to delay this uh, big cost center? And especially in our country, all we all know is that the, we have painful and long administrative acquisition procedures that delay really the start of a new system. But are we? A, a upgrade of uh, run exercise. And also to be able to more invest in capacity building on training on human, let's say, and for the founding of the set activity, knowing that we have little budget, in fact, for our CCIT. In CCIT, in fact, we need a very strong CCIT uh, security architecture. Since we'll be, you know, uh, uh, separated by hackers. So we need to uh, create cardinal quantitative also completeness of deployed solution inside our infrastructure, our network. We need tools for implementing the system process services, you know, incident handling and so on, alert and warning and so on. 
we need for virus and multi-platform investigation and forensics too. Also, if we need also some hardware-based solution for phone uh, forensics and so on, but we need various uh, tools. So very big budget, expensive validation, especially are required. That's why the solution is the use of open source tools. Since we have zero license, if you choose to accompany what we have as commercial tool with most of commercial tools. I will not say exclusively open source tool, but we permit that we, we grow rapidly. This is a beautiful world, so open source tools, free license, of course, but also source code available. We have respect of standard, we have very good GUI and very good community assistance. We have parity sometimes better than commercial solution. But if you want you know, assistance starting, we can do it for the most solution. You have contractual support and training, what is called the community open core now. We are moving from open source to open core and the window is closing. So please do fast. People will say open source is not secure because the code is can be sold by anyone. Believe me that no software is so reliant on safety of uh, source code. If this was true, Microsoft will be going to be the most secure OS of this and we know the reality. Commercial tools have better support tonight. You have the assistance of and very philanthropic and rich and friendly from the community. But also, if you want real, you know, assistance, you can do what you have, you know, contact your cheap support for training assistance and so on from the most open source. So, the last slide would be that uh, the free access to source code will permit to launch the search and development activity. And by customizing and extending, you know, uh, source. In fact, when we master deployment, we master tools, we can go rapidly to such activity. Also, you are a legal provider for the source solution. When you go to handle an incident in your constituency, uh, especially in our country, you find a very disastrous solution situation. Open source permit you to at least provide the basic protection to those guys without any in, legally, you know, and this very interesting impact of open source tools. Thank you, I think I finished it. I want to do it to fill the gaps and maybe we go to the second uh, so, uh, uh, track. I think I have a problem. Okay. So maybe we go rapidly to the second track. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, we have four speakers. Um, very interesting speech from uh, And maybe we'll start immediately with uh, Mrs. Guerin and Julie's from CERT XLM. Bonnet, are you there? Yes, I am here. Thank you, Nabil. So, rapidly, uh, permit me to the room so rapidly. So, sorry. Okay. Thank you. So, Bonnet is one of them in 2019 uh, of uh, the CCIT XLM unit, CCIT, it's a CCIT based in Luxembourg, and uh, which have syndicates as subsidiary in Africa. Mr. Guernel will present the open source tool that uh, they use it and found useful to investigate the O365 and your incident. And some caveat they had that we Please, Guernel, the floor Thank is you. Yours. Thank you for the introduction, Nabi. And thank you for uh, all the organizers for the, the amazing preparation for this event. 
So indeed, uh, I work uh, at uh, CertXLM, the sister of uh, Excelium, a company based in uh, Luxembourg. And we also intervene in Africa through subsidiary uh, Suricat. So today we will deal with uh, Office 365 and uh, Azure, more precisely with a business email compromise uh, as uh, this uh, kind of uh, incident uh, occurs more and more. And uh, I will present uh, how uh, we deal with it in my team, uh, the toolbox we want, uh, that we want to be uh, as uh, small as possible and uh, also uh, reliable to collect uh, to, uh, and to parse and automate the logs uh, to get insights uh, about the attacker activities. And to give a bit, uh, bit of context, in a search incident, uh, we will, uh, we, we will, uh, we will uh, expect uh, to find uh, the root cause, how the attacker gets in, uh, how, what the attacker did, the extent of the compromise, and of course, to uh, get uh, the attacker out of uh, the, the information system, so to contain and, uh, and to recover from it. And in the context of uh, Office 365 and uh, Azure, uh, it uh, adds lots of uh, complexity. I listed uh, some of them here, uh, but there is uh, certainly lots of uh, other we don't know yet about. Uh, and uh, this is even more difficult given the complexity of the platform. Uh, just to, get, to depict a bit, uh, there is uh, more than 15 admin consoles. So you can imagine the redundancy of uh, the configuration uh, and, uh, and the multiple uh, pages you have to, to browse to, uh, to ensure your config configuration is correct. Uh, you have also complexity with uh, licensing. Uh, depending uh, on uh, your, uh, your uh, license, you will not have the same log retention, the same uh, security features. So it will be difficult to more or less difficult to, uh, to investigate. You also have, uh, and we will uh, dig, uh, dig inside this uh, in, the, uh, in the next slides, uh, the, uh, the variety of uh, logs. And depending on how you collect them, you don't have the same results. You have not the same limitation. You uh, don't have the same fields in the logs, the same information. You, uh, sometimes you also have latency. Uh, and uh, sometimes also you have uh, simply logs uh, corrupted uh, just by design uh, uh, from, uh, from Microsoft. And also uh, it's the cloud. So it's not only web services, it's uh, also uh, authentication protocols. And if you use some uh, old ones, uh, you, uh, you can expect some uh, multi-factor authentication bypass. There is also the notions of uh, OAuth uh, applications uh, it's a new form of phishing because uh, instead of uh, just uh, inviting the user to enter uh, his uh, credentials on the phishing web page, uh, it's uh, the legitimate pop-up from Microsoft to enter credentials just to give uh, uh, authorization to an application. And this authorization can be uh, reading any email, fetching the, the address book, writing email, uh, impersonating the user. So. It's a, it's a new, uh, new phishing and it's hard for end user to, uh, to detect it. And you also have uh, the, the notion of a guest partner access, which uh, defaults are uh, just open to everyone. Users can also uh, in, uh, add some uh, application in Office Online and there is no love about this. And there is also the feature to share documents with, uh, with uh, someone. So back to, uh, back to the, the focus of the talk, uh, the logs we are interested in, uh, in the case of a business email compromise incident, we want to see the logins of the user. We want to see uh, the, the, the activity of the user. So all of this is contained in the, what is called Azure ID sign-in. The risky user and sign-in represents the, the artificial intelligence added by Microsoft, it can provide great insight too. The Azure AD audit logs represent, so 
sorry, uh, you have uh, some troubles with the chat. Okay, I'm back. Uh, so the Azure AD Audit Logs represent the activity on user groups and these famous applications. So, uh, but only the management part, user created, uh, permission added, and so on. The O365 audit logs represent, will uh, contain the attacker activity also, but on the applications like uh, OneDrive, uh, the Exchange Mailbox, and so on. Then we, uh, we, uh, we have also, we are interested in the message trace report, uh, meaning all the messages uh, sent and recited by a user. And the, 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 this uh, registered application to figure out if there is uh, some uh, rogue ones and uh, which permission uh, they have. So depending on uh, your uh, license, you can fetch them uh, through the graphical interface or from PowerShell. And we will prefer PowerShell because we want reliable logs so that we can script. We, uh, we have homogeneous results. If when you use the, uh, the graphical interface, it's, it, it was observed, we observe that it's not always the case. We also have a better retention from the graphical interface. Sometimes you can only extract one month while there is three months retention. Uh, from PowerShell, we are sure that, uh, we are sure that the logs are not corrupted because sometimes it's a CSV format with a JSON nested inside. So uh, the JSON is sometimes uh, corrupted from the graphical interface. And also it is uh, mentioned in the official documentation that uh, in the graphical interface, you might have 24 hours between the activity. So imagine a login from the attacker and the time you see it in the graphical interface. With, Power with PowerShell, you don't have this limitation. So let's move on now uh, in each of these, uh, these uh, logs to figure out how we deal with open source tools to uh, reliably extract them, uh, taking into also uh, into account that uh, the client might not be familiar with it. So with PowerShell commands, there is lots of options. So we wanted a way to always get the same logs, the same uh, level of details in logs even if the, the client uh, is not familiar with, uh, with the tool. And so for this, uh, we, uh, we found this, uh, this great uh, framework from the ANSI, the, National, uh, the French National Agency, uh, with which it is as simple as getting the start and the end of logs we want and execute, that's all, in command line, in PowerShell. So this is to extract, and as, as you can see on the right, you have uh, lots of uh, lots of information, lots of K in the JSON. Uh, so simply with the JQ uh, command line tool, you can extract uh, in a, uh, in a CSV because it's easier to build a timeline of uh, these events. The only the K uh, you uh, you are interested in. So this is the example we have for the signing logs, the login of the attacker. And especially what is important uh, in this uh, information is the app ID and the resource ID. Uh, in the language, in the world of uh, Microsoft, uh, the app ID is the source from which the, the attacker logged in. So it can be a, a web login, it can be from a PowerShell, it can be from Outlook and the resource ID, which is the destination. So you know uh, which interfaces the attacker could log in. And from, uh, for audit logs, so all related to the user management, if attacker created a new user, if he, uh, he, if he escalated his privilege and so on, we use the same framework, the same module, for, uh, which I would put uh, in JSON2. And in, in fact, it is the, the exact same uh, command as, uh, as for logins. It's all bundled in the same command. And then you have an easy way to, uh, to script uh, with a GQ uh, to, to extract uh, an overview of uh, what the, the attacker did. So the user who, the, who operated, the initiated by user principal name, and the activity display name. And this, give you, this will give you a quick overview of the attacker activity 
And then you will have to build a timeline for each different activity name. I give an example uh, with uh, the activity consent to an application. So if the compromised user uh, was used to, uh, to, to register a new application, a rogue application, and the difficulty is that the field of interest is different for each uh, different activity. So for instance, for consent to application, you will be interested in the activity date time, the IP address, the user, and uh, the target of what was uh, consented to which application. And if you, uh, if, uh, if you spot another malicious activity from the attacker, you will have to filter with a select on, on the name of this activity, and then uh, uh, mention the, instead of field one, field two, the, the field uh, that, is, that are interesting for, uh, for, this, uh, for this activity. But at least you have a command line tool uh, which, uh, uh, with which you can automate the, the extraction of insights. The same applies for uh, application register to, to list uh, all of them on the uh, channel. Yes. If you allow me to interrupt, you, could you go faster because you may go over really out of time. You go. Uh, it, uh, I guess it's not Three only minutes. 10 minutes, but yes, okay. Uh, ahead, you, but... you will have uh, all my slides uh, with all the information. So it is the same for application registered with, uh, with the same module, simple as simple as uh, getting, uh, mentioning the start date, the end date you need. And uh, the, if you want to filter on only some users, you can specify the email of the users. And it is always the same with GQ to, uh, to automate this. With message trace report, it's a bit different because we need the graphical interface. And there is uh, some, uh, some surprise that uh, Microsoft uh, will embed for you. So to summarize, you have a, a powerful uh, framework with, uh, with, uh, from ANSI to handle uh, the, the PowerShell command to handle the token refresh, the APL throttling, uh, and uh, the limited uh, number of resolute per query. So all of this is, uh, is bundled in this framework and simple to use for a client. And you will get a stable, uh, stable logs uh, to then uh, parse and automate the, the extraction of uh, attacker activity. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, three known uh, caveats uh, in, uh, in uh, um, Microsoft Logs. The first is regarding the login. Uh, be prepared that it's hard to identify the primary connection of the attacker. Uh, when you connect uh, to a web interface, one login will generate around 30 lines of logs. So it's difficult, the, the triage is difficult. And the application ID are not always listed for the tenant. There is also some internal ID that are not documented by Microsoft. So to detect rog wags, it can be quite a, quite a mess. And the message stress report are not, uh, not ex uh, always uh, exhaustive. So that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jornel, for this uh, very interesting sharing of experience that show the uh, power of uh, open source tools managing also complex incidents. And so I'm having a great pleasure to introduce Mr. Mohammed. Mahmoud, sorry, Raouf, member of the Egyptian National CCRT EG Cert, which is uh, incident handled from 2010. He's currently responsible for conducting incident investigation and forensics for national top level sector. Mr. Mohammed will share the EG Cert his rich experience in digital forensics and incident handling using open source tools. Uh, we share his detailed uh, CV via Zoom chat, the CV available on the website. Please, Mr. Mahmoud. Hi, all. Do you hear me well? Yeah, we are hearing you. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Thanks, Professor Napil. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about uh, the agenda. So let's uh, get in depth. The agenda is, uh, starts with the incident life cycle. Then, uh, in the preparation phase and analysis phase, the tools, open source tools, we used in these phases. So let's go with the incident life cycle. 
uh, based on NIST, uh, the standard, uh, it's a life cycle uh, uh, continuous four phases, starting with the preparation. Then second cycle uh, goes with identification and analysis. Then third cycle goes with containment, eradication, and recovery. And finally, lesson learned. Preparation, we will go with the preparation tools. It's mainly about the tools and the behavior of the, of the technical people and preparing all of this. So what's the most uh, important tools we use in the preparation phase? Actually, we have two, the high project and RTIR. The Hive project actually is a scalable open source and free security incident response platform designed to make life easier for SOC, CSERT, and CERTs. The Hive consists of two parts, Cortex, which is a powerful observable analysis and active response engine. So observables such as IP, email address, URL, domain names, file, or hashes can be analyzed using a web interface. Also, analysts can automate this operation and submit large set of observables from the Hive project through Cortex REST APIs. And for RTIR, which is a ticketing system based on request tracker incident response, actually it's an enterprise grade tracking system. It allows the organization to keep track of what needed to get done, who is working on which task, and what's already been done. RTIR is built on all the features of Request Tracker, RT, and, provide, and provides pre-configured queues and workflows designed for incident response teams. It is a tool of choice for many CERT and CSERT teams all over the globe. RTIR also has a dedicated incident dashboard with pre-built lists of most due, due tickets. Also, it can search tickets on any metadata attributes including like status, dates, linked user, and custom fields. This is for the preparation phase, and we will go with the analysis phase. We have many tools used. First, we will talk about GRR, which is Google Rabbit Response. Uh, it's an incident response framework focused on remote live forensics. The goal of GRR is to support forensic and investigation in a fast, scalable manner to allow analysts to quickly to reage attacks and perform analysis remotely. GRR consists of two parts, client and server. The client is deployed on systems that one might want to investigate. So once deployed, GRR client periodically pulls GRR front-end server for work. And by work, I mean running a specific action, downloading a file, listing a directory, etc. The other part is a server, which consists of several components that allow analysts to schedule actions on clients and view process collected data. Actually, GRR was built to run at scale, so the analysts are capable of effectively collecting and processing data from a large number of machines. And also, a most important tool we use is volatility, which is used for memory forensics. Volatility is a command line tool uh, it's already developed too much well and it has a forensic tool for extracting artifacts from memory dump it can analyze raw dumps crash dump vmware dump virtual box dump and many others in many cases critical data pertaining to attack or threats will exist only in system memory including network connections account credential uh, chat messages, encryption keys, running process, injected code fragments, internet history, uh, anything that's non cacheable in the machine itself on the hard disk. So, any program malicious or otherwise must be loaded in memory to execute. So, making forensics memory, forensic critical for identifying otherwise uh, obfuscated attack. Then we will go with the sys internals. Actually, sys internals was developed by, by Microsoft uh, teams and uh, joined uh, Microsoft, which helped administrator and developer in their activity. But over the years, multiple capabilities have been added and tools have been created to add malware analysis in finding malicious behavior. 
So this, this internal suite contains more than 70 tools. So we will go past with most important tools. So let's start with like uh, something called auto runs. Auto runs has the most comprehensive knowledge of auto start location of any startup monitor. Shows you what program are configured to run during system boot up or login. Something like prog dump, which is a processor dump. A command line also utility, which for primary purpose is monitoring an application for CPU spikes and generating crash dumps during a spike. Something like process monitor is the GUI uh, from proc dump, also for Windows to show real life time system registry and process thread activity. Something also like Sysmon, which is a Windows system service and device driver that once installed in system remain resident across system repos to monitor and log system activity on Windows. Also for uh, Process Explorer, it shows you information about which handles and DLL process that have been opened or loaded. Lastly, we will go with uh, something that's very interesting, which is SANS poster. It's uh, not a tool, but actually it uh, gives us a uh, full potential to see over the instant very well. There is three posters, which is the red poster, which is talks about Windows forensics, and the blue poster, which is talks about Hunt Evil, and the black poster with Eric Zimmerman tools. Well, let's start with the red poster. It's a Windows forensic analyst cheat sheet uh, used by analysts e to easily investigate digital forensic cases using different categories like file knowledge, file deletion, browser artifacts, USB artifacts, and so on. Then go with the blue poster. It has a, a known as no find evil, no normal. So in the, by knowing what's normal on a Windows host helps you cut through to no, the noise to quickly locate potential malware. It starts with the normal process and count of each process and the parent process and pass for the process to easily investigate about rogue process. The second page of the poster in the blue poster talks about lateral movement from the attacker and the evidence of execution. The last one is a tool from someone called Eric Zimmerman, which is a developer, a really good developer, has a wealth of data stored uh, tools. Uh, mainly it's the command line tools. Uh, as uh, Eric Zimmerman tools, it's a Windows uh, data stored very, uh, very much. So if you uh, encounter a sizable hard drive, it could be hours or even days before you are ready to even start your investigation. So with Eric Zimmerman, it's uh, using descriptable, scalable, and repeatable results, uh, and has uh, astonishing speed and accuracy. So from one investigation to from a uh, week, it can take uh, only hours to uh, finish it. There are many tools used to parse a lot of systems so artifacts such as mcache, link files, timeline explorer, registry parser, mft parser, and so on. Thank you very much for the time. I uh, hope uh, anyone asks anything, I, I will be with you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Mahmoud, for very, uh, this very interesting presentation, which shows the power of uh, open source tools to conduct investigation and also forensics. Uh, thank you for this uh, large spectrum of tools that uh, show it. I hope there is the question we are, don't see question in the QR section, please do, also in French. And may I now introduce last but not least, uh, this is Mary Mahjou. She's a member of Tunisian National CC Tune Search from 2018. Well, she's, she's currently a member of the Isaac Seher team. Mariam will share the Tune Search's rich experience in conducting the research and development activity using open source tools. Uh, when building uh, from 2006, yeah. The uh, security monitoring system for the uh, national cyberspace in Tunisia. So please, Mariam. Thank you. Uh, uh, just uh, I want to be sure that you um, that you all uh, see my slides. 
Yes, we do. The full screen slides. Yes, we do. Yes. OK. Thank you, Mr. Nebi. Uh, hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to present to you the Seher platform, which is a cyber threat supervision platform based mainly on uh, open source tools. Um, well, uh, Seher is a technical platform. Uh, it's based on open source tools, like we said in the beginning. Uh, it's developed by the Information Sharing and Analysis Center team and treats real time cyber attack monitoring. Um, Seher collects data from different sources, uh, like the different feeds, our SOC and incident teams. We proceed to the treatment and filtering of this data according to several criteria like uh, origin source, the nature of the tags, etc. Finally, we share IOC or uh, GTP, uh, which stands for Tactic Techniques and Procedures with our teams. And we publish, uh, sorry, and we publish awareness button uh, through our channel. We can also perform training sessions uh, via uh, cyber drill exercises. Um, Seher has several components such as services availability supervision, IP reputation, detection of massive attacks, uh, behavior study of attackers, and uh, so on. The majority of these components are developed from 100% open source tools, such as um, Zabbix, which monitor the availability of services, or uh, Suricata, uh, which helps in the detection of attacks. Some uh, of these tools will be detailed in the training session of uh, tomorrow. Um, Seher has also several feeds that, allowed, that allows it to function properly. Most of these data sources are uh, free of charge, like shadow servers, um, which reports blacklisted IP, accessible RDP, SMB, uh, and other protocols, zone H, uh, which uh, reports defacement websites or fish tank uh, with deals uh, with phishing uh, websites. Uh, due to uh, the time limitation, I will take two examples which make Seher a success story in Tunisia and which are Seher, which are, yes, uh, Seher botnet detection and Seher active monitoring. I will start first with our botnet detection project. The system is based on ELK and consists of three main operations. First, we collect the, lo uh, the log files from different DNS servers located at different ISPs. This raw data is huge and unfiltered. So the next logical steps, the next logical steps is to reduce the size and only keep meaningful entries. In order to do this, we compare the collected data with our uh, database um, of malicious domain. Finally, the output is displayed in various da dashboards and monitoring by our SOC team. Here, a dashboard, uh, a screenshot of the botnet detection dashboard. On the top, we can, we can see the number of, of botnet per day, the number of unique IP addresses, and the total number of botnet. Here you can find uh, or you can see the list of detected botnet uh, sorted by the number of times the malicious domain has been visited. In the bottom of the screen, you can see uh, a graph dividing the malicious domain as well as the details of malicious domains or botnet. Uh, the next project is Seher Active Monitoring. In this project, we have deployed several sensors uh, to monitor the network traffic of our partners and detect any malicious activity in real time. The deployed, the deployed node synchronizes with our master node ho hosted in, in our data center to, prov uh, to provide us with a comprehensive view of the national cyberspace uh, threat level and alert them if any serious attack is uh, detected. Uh, here you can find an example of a deployed node is a security onion machine configured to sniff the edge inbound and outbound traffic. You can see here the Suricata, the recent Suricata alerts with their corresponding severity uh, level here. 
This dashboard is very useful for both us and our partners who can access the same data. Um, another aspect of what we do within uh, the SEHER service is the continuous supervision of the national uh, cyberspace. Within the team, we are always on the lookout for uh, security, security buttons or new uh, published CV. We analyze, we test the vulnerabilities in order to identify the potential, um, the potentially affected organization that we notify through vulnerability notices. Finally, we remain at the, at the disposal of this organization for any assistance in order to reduce the risk as much as possible. The last phase is to check whether the recommendation, uh, whether the affected organizations have applied the given uh, recommendation. In the rest of the presentation, we will give you an example of how we dealt with proxy logon uh, CV. A scan of national uh, cyberspace allowed us to discover nearly uh, 200 exchange uh, servers, uh, many of which are vulnerable and others are compromised with the web chat. The TwinSert published an alert button uh, through the website. After this diffusion, a task force was created and the rules were dispatched. dispatched between the team members, uh, all uh, our sensors were, uh, was updated, was updated uh, by new, uh, new rules, um, and the continuous research for new affected IP was performed through our SEHER kits. An action plan uh, was made. We alerted the concerned organism, and an intervention, an intervention was planned to remediate to the problem. During this operation, we treated approximately uh, 200 exchange servers. We patched nearly 131 and neutralized about 26. Uh, here, a graph showing us a decrease in the number of vulnerable um, of the of vulnerable servers here in red, uh, against the increase of the number of uh, patched servers mentioned uh, mentioned in light blue. Thank you for your attention. I will speed, I, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, speed, but it's okay. I respected the little bit time. That's good. Okay. Uh, okay. I haven't talked about correlation of events anyway. Oh. <laughs> so this is proof a little bit uh, what mm -hmm. you can do if you master open source tools. You can integrate them, you can customize them, and you can yes. Build a very interesting systems for securing the cyberspace, or also internal information system. And this is one of the cases when that is the research development, which was permitted first by mastering a little bit open source tools. Yes. So I think we are running a little bit of time, as Tracy said. If there is.